welcome to the Church of the Redeemers Weekly Podcast. We pray that you will enjoy this week's service, and we hope that you will follow us at www.cotrb.org, and may God continue to bless you. get to the word of God, we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we will also read a verse in chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. One thing about it, our electronic vices, devices are helping us to learn the books of the Bible, aren't they? Because we keep scrolling up there. We say, oh, there it is. Yeah, praise the Lord. God uses everything. Amen. He uses everything and anything to bless his people. But it's in the New Testament. If you have it, you see your neighbor still turning, help your neighbor. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody have it? If not, say, hold up. Everybody has it. Yeah, so I can tell. Second Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 7 through 12. And then we'll go to chapter 5, and I'll read verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, I need you to find a neighbor that you can talk to right now. We did this back in December. Some of you remember. Only one of you can talk at a time. Okay. So find a neighbor that you can talk to. I didn't mean it like that. Y'all were, I just realized why y'all were laughing. Praise Jesus. Find, <laughs> praise the Lord. Find a neighbor, and one of you will talk at a time. How about that? Does that sound better? All right, everybody ready? Look at your neighbor, the one who's speaking, and say, what if? And then the other one will say, what if what? What if? See, Linda, that's why I'm not the choir director. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, but that's good. Let's ask it again. What if? What if we all? What if we surrendered our all? Praise the Lord. And I'll add to that during this time of our transition. What if we surrendered all? Praise the Lord. Let's bow in prayer. God, we come in the name of Jesus. And truly, we do need you to minister this word. God, you have already prepared the soil of our hearts, and that's why we're here. So we ask, oh God, that your word would indeed find each one of us, bring forth fruit, fruit for your glory, and fruit that will remain. As always, Father, I need you to move me out of your people's way. And move them out of my way so that you can have your way. Only you can minister this word. So I yield to you, Holy Spirit, to do anything and everything that you want to do during this service. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. The title for our sermon this afternoon is, What If We Surrendered All? According to the theologian Paul J. Ochtemeyer, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians is actually the Apostle Paul's fourth letter 
to the Corinthian church. Now, I'm not going to give any further information as to why the letter we call 2 Corinthians is not the second letter to this church, because I don't want to spoil the fun for the senior class that has just began this semester at the Redeemer Institute for Christian Education. In this letter to the Corinthian church, Paul reminds, re, excuse me, Paul responds to attacks on his character and authority. He explains the nature of Christian ministry and, as an example, openly shares about his ministry. What if we surrendered all and openly shared? This is an important letter for any who wish to be involved in any kind of Christian ministry because it has much to teach us about how we should operate in ministry today. Our text starts by reminding us that we are not the stars of this show, but God is. For verse 7 says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are the jars of clay, <clears throat> excuse me, the earthen vessels. And clay jars were containers created by skilled potters who took raw clay, shaped and molded it as they desired, and then baked the clay until it was hard. They then painted glazed or decorated the jars for whatever purpose they had in mind. In ancient times, sacred scrolls or valuable documents were rolled up and placed inside a jar of clay and then hidden for safekeeping. The Dead Sea Scrolls were kept in such jars of clay. It's interesting how the sacred the valuable were placed inside jars of clay. It's also mind-boggling to think that our holy God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who breathed into man and he became a living soul, this God allows us jars of clay, earthen vessels to house the treasure, the gospel, within us. The message says, if you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this message, this precious message, around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. And that proves, as the scripture says, that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. What if we surrendered all? When we think of surrendering all, we tend to think of such things that we do on the outside of our bodies, so to speak. Those things that have the potential to do us bodily harm, give us diseases, or perhaps lead us one day to become incarcerated. But those things are not the only things we should focus on and are not our primary focus today. Today, the spirit of the living God is directing us to focus on those things that lie dormant within and then again are maybe not so dormant after all. God is zeroing in on the ways in which we still live on our own, not consulting him at least not seriously, about our daily lives. We're still deciding where to live, where to send our children to school, which job to take, and even which church to attend without ever consulting him. We're still leaning to our own understanding as we decide how to do ministry in his church. We open our meetings with prayer, but our agenda is what's coming forth because we made up our minds the night before which way this thing was going to go. We come to God's church 
after he has redeemed us with the Lord Jesus' precious blood and expressed to him how grateful we are that he thought we were worth saving, worth keeping, and that he even cleaned us up on the inside. But there isn't any way, or perhaps I should use Aretha's words, ain't no way we're going to let him rule over us. We tend to say things like, this is my ministry. And especially now that I'm the president or the chair, the leader, the dean, or whatever the title may be. And I'm going to get things in order. But according to whose order? Do we think perhaps we should pray about it? God, I believe you made me the president the superintendent, the chair, the leader, the dean, the pastor. And now I'm asking you to let me know how you want things to go. What if we surrendered all and let him lead? Did y'all hear that? I just heard something. Not that, but that, another thing. Did you hear that? I heard something. I'll tell you what the question was that I heard. I don't know which way it came from, but I heard it. The question was, and this is how it came forth. What do you mean asking me did I pray about it? I run the hobby shop at work, and this is how we do it. And we're quite successful. God didn't call us to be successful. He called us to be a lot of things. But successful is not one of them, at least not the way we define it. Hear God's words to a new ministry leader in Joshua 1. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. What if we surrendered all? There it is, right there in Joshua. The prescription for success, God's way. Let's check it out, dose by dose. Number one, we must be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's what we got to put on the whole armor of God, recognizing that the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We've got to stop fighting each other. Then we've got to be courageous because some of them folks on the ministry are going to try to scare you. Oh, yeah. Praise Jesus. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And if he called you to lead, as Sister Rachel told us, you got to be the leader. And we know leadership has his privileges. And I'm saying that facetiously because the buck stops with the leader. And when God is coming to take account of the ministry, he's coming to, to deal with the leader. Then he'll deal with the members, but he's going to deal with the leader first. Be careful wanting to be in charge. You can get your little feelings hurt. A lot of times. That's why you got to be strong in the Lord. That's why you got to know the word of God. Because if you don't know the word of God, when the folks start coming at you on the ministry, you'll leave the church. But you got to know that God called you to the drama. And he called you to walk in the authority of the leader. Oh, help us, Lord. Next dose. Be careful to be obedient. Careful. Then we must keep the word on our lips. We can't keep it on our lips if we're not hiding it in our heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever we're putting in there, that's what's going to come out. 
So if we're not speaking the word. See, drama's going to come up, but we got to keep applying the word to it. But we can't apply the word to it if we don't know the word. So that's why we're suffering a whole lot of things. We really don't have to suffer because we don't know the word. And so we're yielding to the fleshly drama. Okay. The scripture says don't be anxious. We're going to get anxious because we're human beings. So when we get anxious, we're supposed to go to the word. Lord, you said for me not to be anxious for anything, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let my request be made known to you. And I'm anxious. The guy wrote the book, help, Lord, I'm anxious. I'm scared about this thing. But would you help me because I'm coming to you? Because your word teaches me in John, and without you, I can do nothing. So that means I can't stop being anxious, so I need you to help me stop being anxious. You understand what I'm saying? You got to know the word. Keep it on your lips. Then we must meditate on it day and night. Meditate means we got to think about this thing. If you get the word, be strong. You got to say, Lord, what's that mean for me? What's that mean for me in AV? What's that mean for me as a choir member? You know, we want to talk about ministry. Well, what does that mean for me on my job? Oh, because I got that meeting tomorrow. How can I be strong and go to that meeting? Because you know how they are, Lord, and they already pick with me. You know, because of you, prayerfully we're suffering as uh, imitating Christ. I'm going to be good, Lord. Praise the Lord. Meditate on it. Think about it. Don't just read the scripture and run out the door. Think about it. Take one verse and just think about that. The Lord is my shepherd. What does that mean to me today on my job, him being my shepherd? And then you say, I'm going to think about this thing. I'm going to turn the radio off in the car today, and I want to think about you being my shepherd today, Lord God, Now, how I shall not want. And by the time you get to where you're going to park, you'll be getting out the car. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, because you thought about it, and he got in there with you, and he opened it up in ways to you that you never saw before, that no preacher could preach and no teacher could teach what the Holy Ghost ministered to you. But you got to meditate on it. See how we're missing out? We're missing out. Meditate on it day and night so that we will be careful to be obedient. Now, if we do these things, we will not only be successful, but also prosperous. Anybody not want to be prosperous? Then we got to also get in there and find out what does that mean according to God's definition about being prosperous. And it means part of what we think, too. Now, please note that obedient does not mean be perfect, okay? We were not perfect children, but we learned to become obedient children. Oh, didn't we? Didn't we learn? Ooh, ow, 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 ow. We learned. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. And them, our parents could have got arrested today. But we can say, thank you, Lord. Because it kept us out of a whole lot of worse stuff that we got. And think about all the stuff we got in and we was getting beaten. What would have happened if we hadn't have been getting beaten? We'd have been doing prison ministry from the inside. Okay. Oh, help us. Thank you, Lord. You can look back and say, thank you, Lord. In Matthew 20, when the sons of Zebedee's mom was looking for an opportunity for success for her boys, she asked Jesus if her sons could sit at the right, his right, and his left when he got into his kingdom. So then Jesus knew he had to teach his disciples what it meant to be great, what it meant to be significant. So in verse 25, it says, Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be great among you, the leader, the director, the pastor, the dean, the chair, must be the servant. Where do we think the term servant leader came from? Who did it originate with? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the greatest servant leader of all time. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In Philippians 2, it says that he humbled himself. He humbled himself, took upon him the form of a servant, even to the point of death. What if we surrendered all? How much dying to self have you and I done since we've been in the leadership position that we hold? 
Wake your neighbor up and say, there's a question on the tape. <laughs> or is there still discord on the ministry? Because we, the leader, can't have our way. Do we still not recognize that it is God himself bringing about the opposition and frustration we're experiencing because he's trying to teach us to be like Christ and even more than trying to teach us that, he's trying to make us like Christ. The greatest leaders lead as servants because they model true leadership to those they serve just as the Lord Jesus did. Dictators will only beget dictators. And not even our Lord was a dictator, being very God. How much dying to self have we done since we've been saved? Regardless of our title or position. The Holy Ghost is still working in the room. I'm just waiting on him. That's all. <laughs> Do we not know that quite a few of our help me, Lord, prayers usually mean help this go my way, God? What if we tried help me, Lord, to do things your way or help me, Lord, thy will be done? What if we surrendered all? We are indeed privileged to be entrusted with an awesome treasure, the good news of salvation to a dying world. And because we are, then we will have to suffer with what goes along with that. We are afflicted in every way. But this is only for those who are sharing the treasure. See, God didn't give us the treasure for just walking around with it. I got this treasure in my earthen vessel. Oh, glory to God, glory to God. No! He got the treasure in there for us to give it out. So therefore, if we're doing, and if somebody said, well, are you talking about all this stuff I'm going to have to go through? I don't know if I want to give it out. But baby, if you got it in there, you got to give it out. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. How is the life of Jesus being manifested or reflected in our bodies? Well, well indeed. Galatians 5, after listing the fruit of the Spirit, which is just the evidence that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside, it then says in 24 and 25, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Nudge your neighbor. Nudge your neighbor. And say, those who belong to Christ. Say, is that you? <laughs> those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. <laughs> Therefore, Jesus is being seen as we model him in being healthy. You know, eating properly exercising getting the proper rest you know the scripture does say that it's a sin to stay up late and get up early i just messed up half the church <laughs> somebody say i ain't know that where is it at it's in there google it on your phone it'll come right up but it is it's a sin to stay up late to get up early yeah it's in there it's in there I tell you, you don't have to watch TV or nothing. Read your Bible. <laughs> Another way we can model him in our bodiness is by bodiness. Ooh, praise you, Lord. I saw that word and put that together. You know how you do that? You'll get your turn. Another way that we can model him is through cleanliness and with our personal grooming. And we'll let the Lord have his way with that. Also with our speech. Are we careful with our speech? 
Is there ever a time we check ourselves and say, oop, don't say that? Y'all hear me do it all the time. Like, I'm be good, Lord, I'm be good. Is there ever a time we, we, we don't say everything that comes to our minds? Because one thing I always tell you, you put the words out there, you can't take them back. And let me help the brothers out for a minute here because that's coming up. Should I help the brothers or the sisters? Which is the one who had the problem? <laughs> well, you know what? For all of us, the brothers and the sisters, you can never take words back. You can never take words back. You can never take words back. You can say you're sorry all day long. You can buy, you, buy him or her something special. You can buy her a car. She's never going to forget what you said. So I'm trying to save the brothers some money. <laughs> but you can never take words back. When they're out there, you can apologize until Jesus comes. You can buy all kinds of things, cars and clothes and diamond rings. She's going to be able to tell you that 835 on the morning on June the 17th, we was waiting for the bus on the corner of Broad and Chestnut. And matter of fact, we ran into Deacon Nix, and he had on a brown suit. And we were sitting there saying, where are you going early in the morning with that brown suit on? And that's when you told me that. That's when you said that. Oh, come on now. Hey. What was that movie thing where the, the boy said the line in there? He said, I can't think of it. Who can play that game, I think it was. And the guy said, man, he talking to, to his boy about the stuff about the women. He said, man, you act like the women is like worse than the CIA or something. He said, man, let me tell you something. The CIA ain't got nothing on a woman with a plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are dangerous. But we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are God's works, and that our soul knows right well. Praise Jesus. And the Lord knows that uh, the, uh, his word, let's go back to his word. His word says for the brothers that he who finds a wife yeah. finds a good thing and gains favor with the Lord. Amen. I got to straighten that out, sisters, because they was like on us. <laughs> the word works. Let the word do the work, right? Praise you, Lord. Now, another way that we can model Jesus is by the clothing that we wear. Who's being seen? Us or Christ? Lastly, are we crucifying our flesh daily by not yielding to our car carnal desires? The scripture says sin shall have no more dominion over us. The devil can't make us do anything. Whatever we do, we choose to do. We didn't get caught up. We didn't trip, slip. No. Whatever we do, we chose to do. We made a conscious choice. You started out somewhere. I tell you, your flesh is like a wild dog. It wants nothing to do with the spirit. Don't put yourself in positions where you can possibly. So don't think you that spiritual. Let me make it plain. Don't, don't think you love the Lord like that. And my sister in the back could tell me, she gave me that testimony back there. She said, I found out that I didn't love Jesus as much as I thought I did. <laughs> okay? So don't, let's not try to test our spirituality by putting ourselves in harm's way. And that's all I'll say about that. And why is this so important that we must check ourselves, check how we're living? Because verse 12 says, so that death is at work in us, but life in you. Are we aware that the more we choose to die to self, the more we choose to do what the word says in spite of how we feel about it, in spite of how we're being treated, that life is working in someone else. Someone is being drawn to the Lord by our self-denial. And you don't know who's watching you. Although I don't know all the reasons why, one thing that could be the case is that people want to see if this thing is real. My coworker many years ago before I got saved, there was a girl head her office over here. She was the last one the Lord used with me to be a witness. And she'd be in there every day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I go in in the morning. She wasn't even in there yet. And sometimes I walk in and I look over in her desk area. I say, I ain't going to hear all that God stuff today. Conviction. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. But the thing is, my girlfriend Norma said, Everybody's watching her, and they're waiting for her to fall. She said, but they don't really want her to fall. 
because they want to see, is this real, what she has? And she told me that before I ever got saved, and I always remember that she said that. So somebody is, God has somebody watching you and me. I know when I had to go through certain things here at this church, somebody was a member, and they told me, I praise the Lord for being able to watch you live out your faith because of what I was having to go through in a public way. Praise you, Lord. Think about Minister Tamika's song, You Die for Me. I will die for you. Are we willing to go even further and say, Lord, I will die to what I want in any area of my life because you are the only one who truly wants what's best for me? That's not something we quickly rattle off on our tongues. Oh, yeah, Lord, I don't want this anymore. I, don't, I only want what you want. But there will come a place on your journey where you will get to the place with him where you will say, Lord, and you'll be crying. Trust me when I tell you, you're going to be crying when you say it. Lord, if you don't want this for me, then I don't want this. And it's something that you desperately want. But this is talking about dying. And she, probably she wrote that song, and Mr. Mika was going through that dying. We are constantly dying to self, dying to what we want. And as we die, life is working in somebody else because they know we share with some of them those things that we really want. Hmm. The amazing thing about God is God is willing to give us all of what's best for us in every area of our lives. And just because we die to it doesn't mean he's not going to give it to us. Let's, let's, let's just make sure we get that. Just because we die to saying, well, Lord, uh, if you don't want me married, I won't be married. It doesn't mean you're not going to get married. He just want to make sure you don't want nothing more you want him. See, that's the thing. Do we want it more than we want him? Do you have to fill in this, in this blank here, this space here? Do you have to check this box off God and then you got me? He said, no, I, I, I ain't checking off no boxes. And I want you. And I want all of you. He said that forever Jones said he wants it all. He wants all of us. And then when we can give him the things he's, and, and die to them, because it's going to take some dying to him. You know, because it's easy to say when somebody's been married and somebody want to be married, it's easy to say when they go home and they say, Lord, I'm believing you because you told me one day you're going to give me this husband. And God, you don't understand my biological clock is ticking and yada, 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 yada. Come on, y'all. But God, if you don't want that for me, help me to die to it. I'm willing to give it to you. But you got to help me. You got to help me. Because since I was in the fifth grade, I wanted to be married. You understand what I'm saying? This, this, this is what this journey is calling for, dying to self. We have this treasure in these earthen vessels that we might die to self, that Christ might be seen. Because other than that, we're sitting here whining and moaning and complaining to those who are not saved and sitting there. They're sitting there saying, mm, God, she's been praying for 15 years for this thing, and her God ain't giving it to her. I don't want nothing to do with that God. Because we're whining and moaning about it. Help us, Lord. The more of us that dies, the more Christ is seen, and not only seen, but the more Christ is experienced through us to others. And do we ask God to do that? Praise you, Lord, you're bringing that in. Every day we should ask God to let all those we come in contact with today have an experience with him. Through us. We should ask him that every day because of this treasure that we have on the inside. It's not puffing us up. We're not saying that we the person. We're saying him. It's the surpassing power belongs to him. God, through me, let everybody I come in contact with today have an experience with you through me. God has put us in an environment of people who are still lost. And they need to see Christ. And he puts you there to show them Christ. I don't know what to say. 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 How can I say? I don't know what to say. Were you trying to find out what to say? God, I don't know what to say. What would you have me to say? And you know, he's going to tell you like he sent them seven. Yeah, just go. I'm going to be with your mouth and I'm going to give you what to say. That's all he's going to say. You don't have to know what to say. When you was out in the world, you ain't know what to say, but you walked up to that brother all bow. Hey, baby. Come on now. Come on. 
You ain't say, oh, God, she's so fine. I wonder what I could say. I wonder what I could say. No, you saw it, you want it, and you went for it. Go on and wave your hand, Sister Christine. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. But what's the big deal about all of this? It's in chapter 5, verse 10. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done, he or she has done in the body, whether good or evil. And in the words of Charles Stanley, a clock is ticking. And it's ticking to the countdown of the judgment seat of Christ, also known as the Bema seat which is the elevated platform where they gave out awards for the Olympics and all of that back in ancient Greece. But the Bema seat, the judgment seat, it's a podium. It's going to be raised up where all the audience is going to sit. We're going to all be put on blast, okay? At the Bema seat, the judgment seat, is where all believers will have a face-to-face -face evaluation by the Lord Jesus Christ. Motives will be revealed. And that will cause some of our works to burn up. All genuine sacrifices made openly, but especially those made in secret, will be rewarded. You get the picture. Zig Ziglar, the motivational speaker, had this to say about a performance review in his devotional. And I quote, when you know you're going to meet with your boss in a couple of weeks for a performance review, how do you act? Most of us look at our list of responsibilities to be certain we get all of our tasks accomplished and we make sure we are pleasant to the people around us. The stakes can be pretty high. We may want a promotion, a raise, or we may just want to hear that we're doing a good job so we can stay employed. We do whatever it takes so that the review is as positive as possible. In other words, the reality of the review makes a difference in our choices. The Bible tells us that we'll be called into the boss's office one day for the ultimate performance review. We'll stand before Jesus Christ to give an account of our choices as Christians, end quote. In order to prepare for that day of judgment, we must embrace the suffering of our Savior as we suffer in this life, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Yes, we are afflicted in every way, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, but we are not crushed, not driven to despair, not forsaken and not destroyed. From time to time, though, we may say, yeah, right, but that's how I feel today. And it's how I felt yesterday and last week and as long as I can remember. But we must learn, as the Apostle Paul did, learn how to endure hardness, endure suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I think I heard everybody singing, I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. I'm going to stay on the battlefield till I die. Really? Really? Or is it just a song we like to sing? Now, that brings me, that suffering of this journey, it brings me to the following poem. And the Lord used David Jeremiah to remind me of this. I heard this early on my Christian journey, and I'm going to share it with you. And Lord, I ask that you minister it by your spirit. My child, I have a message for you today. Let me whisper it in your ear, that it may gild with glory any storm clouds which may arise and smooth the rough places upon which you have to tread. It's short, only five words. But let them sink into your soul and use them as a pillow upon which to rest your weary head. This thing is from me. Have you ever thought of it that all that concerns you concerns me too? For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of mine eye. You are, my very, you are very precious in my sight. Therefore, it is my special delight to educate you. I would have you learn when temptations assail you and the enemy comes in like a flood that this thing is from me. That your weakness needs my might and your safety lies in letting me fight for you. Are you in difficult circumstances, surrounded by people who do not understand you, who never consult your taste, 
who put you in the background? This thing is from me. I am the God of circumstances. Thou comest not to thy place by accident. It is the very place God meant for thee. Have you not asked to be made humble? See then, I have placed you in the very school where this lesson is taught. Your surroundings and companions are only working out my will. Are you in money difficulties? Is it hard for you to make both ends meet? This thing is from me. For I am your purse bearer and would have you draw from and depend upon me. My supplies are limitless. I would have you prove my promises. Let it not be said of you in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God. Are you passing through a night of sorrow? This thing is from me. I am the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I have let earthly comforters fail you, that by turning to me you may obtain everlasting consolation. Has some friend disappointed you? Was it one to whom you poured out your heart? This thing is from me. I have allowed this disappointment to come, that you may learn that the best friend to have is Jesus. He will hear you when you call. He will keep you lest you fall. The best friend to have is Jesus. I want to be your confidant. Has someone repeated things about you that are untrue? Leave them to me and draw closer unto me, thy shelter, out of reach of the strife of tongues. For I will bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Have your plans been all upset? Are you bowed down and weary? This thing is from me. You made your plans, then came asking me to bless them. But I would have you let me plan for you. And then I take the responsibility. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. You are only an instrument, not an agent. Have you longed to do some great work for me and instead been laid aside on a bed of pain and weakness? This thing is from me. I could not get your attention in your busy days, and I want to teach you some of my deeper lessons. They also serve, they also serve who only stand and wait. I want you to learn to sing. I am not eager, bold, or strong. All that is past. I am ready not to do. At last, at last. Some of my greatest workers are those shut out from active service that they may learn to wield the weapon of all, prayer. Are you suddenly called upon to occupy a difficult and responsible position? Launch out on me. I am trusting you with the possession of difficulties. And for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. This day, I place in your hand this pot of holy oil. Make use of it freely, my child. Let every circumstance as it arises, every word that pains you, every interruption that would make you impatient, every revelation of your own weakness, be anointed with it. The sting will go as you learn to see me in all things. Therefore, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing, ye shall prolong your days in the land. Praise the Lord. Sometimes we sing the song, here I am to worship. Really? What if God is unhappy with our praise? Are we willing to change the way we live? The way we give? The way we walk, the way we talk. Are we ready to live a life pleasing to our king? Are we willing to read God's holy word and then let our praises be heard? Then we can cry out as the songwriter, Lord, just be pleased. Lord, 
just be pleased? What if we surrendered all to the Lord? Could that be the difference? Could that be what makes him happy with our praise? And more than with our praise, could that be what makes him happy with the way we live daily? Our surrender to him? If you're here today and you've never given your life to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a clock that's been counting down for you as well this morning. The countdown is to your meeting God at the great white throne judgment. If you find yourself there, you're doomed to spend eternity apart from God. God is the God of another chance and another chance. But if you find yourself at the great white throne, then know that your chances had run out when you died without Christ. Hallelujah. Will you stand as you're able? As the deacons come today, this message has been a message primarily for believers. But nevertheless, there may be someone here who has not yet entered into the ark of safety. You have never been introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says, in the day that you hear his voice, and trust me, he is speaking. If you hear his voice calling you, don't harden your heart. Amen. Don't wait for tomorrow, next year, next month. Don't wait like I used to think, hey, by the time I'm 40, 50, 60, I'll be ready to start oh, going to church. Amen. But not now, not when I'm young. The scripture says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Don't wait until you get all old, bent down, feeble, toothless. That's what it says. It's not what I'm saying. It's what the word of God says. In Ecclesiastes, read it. It said, when your eyes grow dim and your teeth are falling out, and then you come in, here I come, Jesus. Here I come. Here I come. What you want me to do? What would you have me to do? No, come while you're young and you're strong and you're vibrant. Come while you can give the Lord your best. So that when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he will be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been serving me since you were 12 years old. Somebody else here, you are saved. But you need to make a fresh commitment to the Lord today. So you didn't think about that great white throne. I mean, not the, well, the great white throne. If you in here thinking about that, you need to run down the aisle. But you never thought about the judgment seat of Christ. Nobody ever told you. You didn't come to Rice and learn that. The judgment seat of Christ is not for us to be judged for salvation. It's where we're going to be judged for everything we've done since we've been saved. And every one of us is going to be there. We're not going to stand together with our church family, with our family. We're going to stand before the Lord alone. And he's going to put us on blast. So if you've never been saved, if you've never said yes to God's precious gift of salvation, don't try to get yourself together. You can't. Just come just the way you are. And know this, please, somebody here today, that God loves you just the way you are. The thing is, he loves you so much, though, he's not going to leave you the way you are. Isn't that the blessing? Then for that person who needs to make a fresh commitment, sometimes it's not even about being in a backslidden state. Sometimes you just let your love get cold for the Lord. You know, circumstances came up, different things discourage you, and you just... As my mother used to say when we were kids, y'all just outens my fire. And sometimes the struggles of life just put your fire out. And you don't have that same excitement that you had when you first got saved. And you say, Lord, I, I want that back. I want to be excited for you again. Then you come on and make a fresh commitment to the Lord. And then somebody else, you're here, you just need a church home. If the Lord is ministering to you to become a part of this church family, then come on down the aisle. Because obviously we would need your gifts here, and you would need us, and we'll work together. This is the day that God brought you here to respond to 
the word. The scripture says we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That means not going to church. He says, as is the habit of some. But he says, all the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The day of the Lord. It's closer than it's ever been. There's no more Bible prophecies left to be fulfilled. The last one was filled in 1948 when Israel became a nation. The Lord is free to come at any moment in time. He could come before we end this service. Is it well with your soul? See, your life is not in jeopardy. Your soul is. Your soul is what's going to live forever, either with God forever or apart from him forever in the lake of fire. Not in hell. Hell is like the detention center. It's just a holding tank where you go waiting for your case to come up. And if you find yourself in hell, know you're going to the great white ju throne judgment. Don't die without Christ. You don't get another chance after you die. Don't think you're not going to die until you're an old man or an old woman. Many children die. Many teenagers die. Freak things are happening every day. We live in a world of terrorism. We live in a world where people are shooting up their places of employment. They're shooting up churches. They're shooting up in the communities. We had the helicopters going over last night. There's no safe place. Is it well with your soul today? Please don't play with your soul. You won't, you won't be able to say, God, I thought I had more time.